Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's presentation. Uh, my name is Emily Parker. I'm the Director of Education at the Rosenbach. And the books that we will be looking at tonight are all from the Rosenbach's collection. But for those of you who haven't been to the Rosenbach before, I wanted to give you an overview of who we are and what we have. We're known for our collection of primarily American and British books and manuscripts. We're currently open for in-person visits. Uh, so if you'd like to visit, you can uh, make an appointment on our website, uh, but most of our programs are still virtual. So if you're not ready to venture out, you can still meet us online. I'll tell you more about what we have upcoming in terms of programs later in the presentation. So before we dive in, I just wanted to take a brief moment to invite you to support the Rosenbach by making a donation if you are able so that we can continue to offer free programming like this. Andrew White, the Rosenbach's volunteer coordinator, will be managing the chat today, as well as sharing links there. I'm really only giving you the tip of the iceberg. There's Andrew waving. Um, I'm really only giving you the tip of the iceberg in terms of books in the collection by our featured authors tonight. So Andrew will be uh, including a link to a collections guide, uh, which will give you uh, more information about what our collection of some of these authors includes. Uh, so again, I'm really just giving you kind of a peek uh, and I'd really encourage you to explore more about what we have in the collection. So for those of you who would really enjoy an interactive experience tonight, um, please feel free to ask questions or make comments uh, in the chat. Uh, but if also, if you'd rather just sit back and relax um, and listen to the presentation, uh, that's totally fine as well. Um, let's get into it. Uh, so tonight's topic uh, is related to social activism. And when you picture activists, at least when I do, um, I think of them participating in de a demonstration holding a handmade sign, expressing their views. But a no less, um, a sort of a less visible, but no less powerful form of social activism is writing and the practice of reading that writing. And during the pandemic, when public demonstrations may have felt unsafe for a lot of people, many turned to books for guidance. really on how to support the causes that they believe in. For example, since the death of George Floyd, books on race and racism uh, specifically have become incredibly popular. During the week of May 24th, there were actually no anti-racist books uh, appearing in the week's top 20 books. Um, two weeks later, only two weeks later, there were actually 11 of, of them featured in, those, in the top 20 most sold books. But of course, writing to further an activist agenda is nothing new. Today we'll be examining some of the works, uh, some works from the Rosenbach's collection by social activist writers, both historic and contemporary. We'll start with an author who you may not be familiar with, Charles Ignatius Sancho. Ignatius Sancho was born on a vessel carrying captive Africans to Spanish colonies in the West where the captives were sold as enslaved people. And then he was orphaned when he was only two years old. The man who enslaved the toddler in the colony of New Granada took Sancho to England and gave him to a family. In an unlikely turn of events, Sancho befriended the second Duke of Montague eventually escaping captivity to live with the Duke and his family. With help from that family, Sancho opened a grocery shop in London that granted him, his wife, and his kids 
a level of financial stability. It also allowed Sancho to become part of the artistic and cultural scene in the city. Sancho, a property holder, also was the first person of African descent known to have been qualified to vote in parliamentary elections in Great Britain, which was pretty incredible. The Rosenbach's copy of Ignatius Sancho's letters that we're looking at right now is a fifth edition. It was published in 1803. The contents of the book touch on a wide range of topics from daily life to Sancho's negative opinions of enslavement. It's one of the first known anti-slavery accounts written by a formerly enslaved person. It's a story about enslavement by someone who lived it. And that's one of the reasons that it's had such an impact on its readers. The Rosenbach copy of his letters is especially interesting because this edition, uh, this fifth edition was published by Sancho's son, making the volume the first English language book to be both written and published by uh, persons of African descent. So we're staying in London for now, um, but fast forwarding about 50 years, turning our attention to Charles Dickens as our second author in tonight's presentation. So Dickens was such a good storyteller that his compelling tales often get more attention than the social activism that lies at its foundation. It's definitely not a stretch to say that Dickens was an activist. He was particularly concerned with the plight of the poor and the imprisoned. He paints such a good picture of the economically and socially disadvantaged because he had firsthand knowledge of it. When he was only 12, his father was jailed because he, oh, his father owed the equivalent of $1,300. And as a result, uh, Charles had to leave school, go to work to support his family at that time. As an adult, he continued to be uh, interested and involved um, in issues related to imprisonment um, and was particularly in con concerned with the detrimental effect that it had on people. Dr. Manette, uh, one of the main characters in A Tale of Two Cities, uh, was imprisoned in the Bastille for 18 years. And Dickens really gives us such a vivid picture of Manette's transformation from doctor to caged and solitary shoemaker that this illustration that we're looking at right now from the Rosenbach's collection is almost superfluous. It's almost even not necessary. This is an excerpt. We're just looking at an excerpt um, from the scene that the image that we just looked at serves to illustrate. Um, and although it's long, I thought uh, I'd take the time to just read through it. I think it really gives you, again, just a wonderful uh, window um, into, um, into um, it, the life of someone that's imprisoned. Good day, said Monsieur Defarge, looking down at the white head that bent low over the shoemaking. It was raised for a moment, and a very faint voice responded to the salutation, as if it were at a distance. Good day. You're still hard at work, I see. After a long silence, the head was lifted for another moment, and the voice replied, yes, I am working. This time, a pair of haggard eyes had looked at the questioner before the face had dropped again. The faintness of the voice was pitiable and dreadful. It was not the faintness of physical weakness, though confinement and hard fare no doubt had their part in it. Its deplorable peculiarity was that it was the faintness of solitude and disuse. It was like the last feeble echo of a sound made long and long ago. So entirely had it lost the life and resonance of the human voice that it affected the senses like a once beautiful color faded away into a poor weak stain. So sunken and suppressed it was that it was like a voice underground. So expressive it was of a hopeless and lost creature that a famished traveler wearied out by lonely wandering in a wilderness would have remembered home and friends in such a tone before lying down to die. 
Some minutes of silent work had passed and the haggard eyes had looked up again, not with any interest or curiosity, but with a dull mechanical perception beforehand that the spot where the only visitor they were aware of had stood was not yet empty. I want, said Defarge, who had not removed his gaze from the shoemaker, to let in a little more light here. You can bear a little more. The shoemaker stopped his work, looked with a vacant air of listening at the floor on one side of him, then similarly at the floor on the other side of him, then upward at the speaker. What did you say? You can bear a little more light? I must bear it if you let it in, laying the palest shadow of a stress upon the second word. Dickens drew from his experience with his father's imprisonment when he was a child, but he also continued to be interested in prisons throughout his life. In fact, he visited Eastern State Penitentiary, and for those of you who are local, you'll be familiar with this prison in Philadelphia. He described his visit uh, in a book that he wrote called American Notes, uh, which was published in 1842, which the Rosenbach has in its collection. And many people really see similarities between the way he describes the Bastille and Dr. Manette and the way he described Eastern State and the prisoners there. So I just wanted to take a moment to read another excerpt. Um, I promise you this is on, the, the only um, other long excerpt that I'll be reading tonight. Um, but I wanted to just go through this again. So um, this is um, a description of a prisoner that Charles Dickens met uh, and spoke with at Eastern State Penitentiary when he visited there. The first man I saw was seated at his loom at work. He had been there six years and was to remain, I think, three more. He had been convicted as a receiver of stolen goods, but even after his long imprisonment denied his guilt and said he had been hardly dealt by. It was his second offense. He stopped his work when we went in, took off his spectacles, and answered freely to everything that was said to him, but always with a strange kind of pause first and in a low, thoughtful voice. He wore a paper hat of his own making and was pleased to have it noticed and commanded. He had very ingeniously manufactured a sort of Dutch clock from some disregarded odds and ends, and his vinegar bottle served for the pendulum. Seeing me interested in this contrivance, he looked up at it with a great deal of pride and said that he'd been thinking of improving it, and that he hoped the hammer and a little piece of broken glass beside it would play music before long. He had extracted some colors from the yarn with which he worked and painted a few poor figures on the wall. One of a female over the door he called the Lady of the Lake. He smiled as I looked at these contrivances to while away the time. But when I looked from them to him, I saw that his lip trembled and could have counted the beating of his heart. I forgot how it came about, but some allusion was made to his having a wife. He shook his head at the word, turned aside, and covered his face with his hands. So after writing American Notes, uh, as well as The Tale of Two Cities, Dickens really became known for his objection to, solitary, to, to imprisonment and in particular solitary confinement. In fact, Sonia Sotomayor uh, quoted American Notes in 2018 during a case alleging that solitary confinement violates the Eighth Amendment. Andrew's just put in the chat an article that tells you a little bit more information about that. The quote um, that she um, that she shared by Dickens um, during her um, during her presentation is as follows: The prisoner is led to the cell from which he never again comes forth until his whole term of imprisonment has expired. He never hears of wife and children, home or friends, the life or death of any single creature. He sees the prison officers. But with that exception, he never looks upon a human countenance or hears a human voice. 
He is a man buried alive to be dug out in the slow round of years and in the meantime, dead to everything but torturing anxieties and horrible despair. So Charles Dickens chose to further his social justice agenda via storytelling. And because he was a very good storyteller, he was really able to transmit that message far and wide. Harriet Beecher Stowe does something really similar. Rather than marching in the streets to oppose the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, Beecher Stowe picked up her pen. And again, because she was such a good storyteller, her Uncle Tom's Cabin became the best-selling novel of the 1800s. Only the Christian Bible, this is absolutely stunning, only the Christian Bible sold more copies during the 19th century. And in the year following its publication, Uncle Tom's Cabin sold 300,000 copies in the US and a million copies in Great Britain. The novel really just had amazing political and social implications on both sides of the Atlantic. Queen Victoria read the book and Harriet Beecher Stowe met with Abraham Lincoln in 1862. What we're looking at here is the Rosenbach's copy of the second British edition of Uncle Tom's Cabin, which the Rosenbach actually purchased at the New York Book Fair uh, right before the pandemic began in March, 2020. So it's one of our last acquisitions before the pandemic started. So we'll be taking a break from fiction for a moment and turning our attention to the poetry of Langston Hughes, as well as an art form that he pioneered, the Black Gospel Musical. The Rosenbach's collection includes letters and greeting cards and flyers uh, that Langston Hughes sent to his friend and fellow poet, Mary Ann Moore. So the flyer pictured here that we're looking at advertises Jericho Jim Crow, which was a gospel musical written by Hughes that premiered in 1964 and championed civil rights for all Americans. Uh, and Andrew just put in the chat a link um, to the music on YouTube um, from, from this musical. It's really, really great. So if you look closely at this flyer that I have up on the screen, you'll see uh, in green ink, bold green ink, a little note from Langston to his pal, Marianne Moore, uh, wishing her happy holidays. What we're looking at next uh, is a first edition of Hughes' collection of poems, The Weary Blues. Hughes was only 24 when this collection was published in 1926. And the collection of poems is really groundbreaking in part because they relate the African experience, African-American experience in such an intimate way. Carl Van Vechten, a photographer and a patron uh, of the Harlem Renaissance, wrote in the introduction of this first edition that Hughes cries bitterly from the heart of his race. Always, however, his stanzas are subjective and personal. It's this powerful combination of intimate and universal it's especially apparent in this poem pictured here and I just wanted to give everyone a moment to read through the poem that I have up on the screen here.
So Barbara has just asked a question in the chat that I am not actually certain of the answer to. Um, she's asked, and Elise actually follows up with the same question um, and just wonders what's the meaning of that word. As far as I know, it's a word that Langston Hughes coined. Um, and I don't know too much more than that. Andrew, do you know any additional information about that? Is that something that, is that a word that he borrowed from someplace else or is that a word that he coined himself? Um, it looks like it is a preamble. Is this the first poem in the book? It is, yes. Oh, okay, well that explains that. So it's sort of a combination of the word preamble and poem. Seemingly, yes. Okay. Or preface. Great. So again, this really is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the Langston Hughes material that we have at the Rosenbach. Um, and I'm certain that we'll continue to collect more as the years go on. So I really would urge you if this is something that you are interested in um, looking at to, to explore our collection more. And I should also take a moment to say, um, we welcome um, researchers of all kinds at the Rosenbach. So you don't have to be writing a dissertation uh, to come and explore the collection. Uh, we're now open for researchers again, um, after being closed for some time. And you can make an appointment um, to visit on our website, uh, just as you would to just visit the museum itself. And you don't even really have to know what you're interested in looking at. You don't have to have a particular title in mind that you're, that you're interested in looking at. Um, our librarian who has worked at the Rosenbach for over 35 years, I believe at this point, Elizabeth Fuller, she's absolutely fantastic, so dedicated and passionate about what she does. There's a little field on the form that you submit when you want to, when you want to make an appointment uh, that just says, what are, you know, share what you're interested in seeing. And if you're interested in seeing more Langston Hughes from the collection, all you needed to do is just say, hey, I saw some of it in a presentation that Emily did online and I'm just interested in seeing more. So you really don't need to provide any more information than that. So I'd really encourage you to do it. It's a, it's a really fantastic way of exploring the collection. And it's not an opportunity um, that a lot of places really give you. Um, to have that one-on-one -on -one experience um, with not only our collection, but with the with our librarian's assistance. It's really pretty amazing. All right, so I will stop waxing poetic um, about our, um, about making a, an appointment with our reading room and, and we'll move on um, to um, something a little bit more contemporary. Uh, the last two authors uh, that I wanted to focus on in tonight's presentation are both contemporary. Uh, pictured here is uh, the Rosenbach's galley copy of Toni Morrison's first novel, The Bluest Eye, which was published in 1970. And this book tells the story of an 11 year old African-American girl who wishes that her eyes were blue so that she would be beautiful. We're actually in the process of planning a read aloud event um, to read from this book um, at Aubrey Ar Arboretum. We're gonna wait until the spring. Um, so for those of you who are local, um, we'd really love for you to join us. Um, Aubrey Arboretum is in Germantown, really wonderful place to visit. So if you keep an eye on the Rosenbach's calendar um, for more information, we really hope you can join us then. And we'll close tonight's presentation with one last great storyteller, Philadelphia's own Lorraine Carey. Um, she's often sort of best known for her book, The Price of a Child, 
Uh, and recently, again, for those of you who are local, um, may have heard that she wrote uh, a play, General Tubman, that was that was uh, produced and put on at the Arden Theater. Um, I think maybe two years ago at this point. But what I wanted to focus on tonight, uh, what we're looking at here is the title and first pages of an edit, edit manuscript uh, from her first book, which uh, was titled Black Ice. And this memoir recounts Lorraine's experiences as a black scholarship student at the formerly all white and actually formerly all male St. Paul's School in New Hampshire in the 1970s. So I wanted to thank all of you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I've, I really hope we've helped you to kind of recognize the um, powerful role that storytelling plays in social activism. Um, I also hope that we've given you some, a few new books to add to your reading list. But before we say good night, I wanted to call your attention to these upcoming virtual uh, and one in person um, behind the book, bookcase tours that are coming up. Um, so we've just started to offer in person behind the bookcases. Again, I think our first one was in July that Andrew presented. The next one will be in August. Uh, that'll be me again presenting that one on uh, Emily Dickinson. Um, but we um, but we are going to continue doing virtual ones as well. So we've got uh, Herman Melville one, um, as well as one on illustrators, great illustrators from the collection. So I'm going to keep the meeting going for um, a couple of minutes just to give you all time to take a look at the links in the chat. Um, but thanks again, everyone, and have a great night.